Okay, before we move into our, our second panel discussion of the day, also uh, looking uh, uh, from a global perspective, I, I would like to thank uh, Oracle, MWG Apparel, uh, Valard, Opus One, Kubra, KPMG, Guidehouse, Northern Transformer, Hatch, Salesforce, Tantalus, MNP, and Redline Communications. Each of these partners have played a significant role in bringing our Powering Partnerships Summit to you today. Now, our next panel features international representatives who will share some of their strategies as they pursue that green economy as they head towards 2050. I'm pleased to introduce Scott Thon to moderate this panel. Scott has served as Altalink's President and Chief Executive Officer since 2002. For over 30 years, he's held a variety of senior positions in the electricity industry, from operations and engineering to market design and financial management. He is also a past chair of CEA's board of directors. Scott, over to you. Welcome everyone. Uh, we have a, a great group uh, with us today. And uh, you know what, rather than listening uh, to me, and we're gonna get into uh, some discussions clearly about from different places on in the world about you know where we're at and where we're going. Um, what I thought I would do, uh, just open it up and, uh, and ask uh, each, of our, each of our panelists uh, first, just to uh, maybe do your own self-introduction and then you people won't have to listen to me um, and you'll do a better job than I will about it. Um, as well as just, just give us kind of like your, your kind of one minute uh, opening about, you know, what, what has really struck you uh, as, we, as we've come through 2020 um, and, um, and, uh, and then we can tee up maybe what that might look like in the future. So, so uh, I don't know, Tom, would you like to kick it off for us? Scott, I'd be glad to, and uh, thank you very, very much for um, inviting me here and for being with, um, with my friends here on the panel. Well, what did I, what's the most important thing that I learned from 2020 is the resilience of this industry. Uh, we really have learned a great deal. Uh, we've adapted to the pandemic. Uh, we've dealt with, you know, hurricanes and derechos and wildfires, uh, and uh, again, had to change our whole operations in terms of doing those things with respect to uh, social distancing and, and maintaining people's health, which we did throughout. Uh, at the same time, we really continued to pursue our own vision and mission and agenda, which was to get cleaner, uh, to get smarter and to get stronger. And, and it really has been amazing how much has been accomplished in a, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, for a long-term industry like ours, we're at 44% uh, reduction in our carbon emissions from 2005 levels, and our commitments uh, to the future are net zero by 2050 or, or in that range, and I think that's uh, incredibly exciting. So uh, uh, lots of opportunities with electric transportation, uh, with uh, electrifying the commercial and industrial sector. So. I think we have a lot to talk about and a lot of exciting things ahead for our industry. Great. Um, okay, who wants to go next? I'm gonna go jump all. And that was, sorry, Tom, you, did, you didn't follow all the instructions. That was Tom Kuhn, uh, who's uh, obviously in the United States and he heads up uh, the group uh, of companies, uh, utilities, uh, EEI. And, uh, and uh, so Tom, I think those are great remarks. And resiliency is the name of the game. Um, and I think uh, it's been impressive, quite frankly, to see how the industry has come together, not just together, as you said, just essentially on helping each other out, but also with government. And I know I've, I've had the pleasure of uh, uh, working with you uh, on a few of those inter interaction calls on the uh, EISAC and, and others. So, uh, you know, I think those are, are well, uh, well, uh, great, great comments. Uh, great comments, uh, uh, Tom, Tom, on that. Okay. Um, well, I don't know where where do we want to go? Uh, where do we want next? I see uh, uh, Sarah. Do you want to you want to kick us off next? Sure, Scott, and thank you very much for having me today. Um, greetings to everyone from Australia. I'm Sarah McNamara. I'm the chief executive of the Australian Energy Council, and we are the representative association for the generators and retailers of electricity and gas in Australia. Uh, 2020 has been a big year for us uh, in this hemisphere as well. Um, I think similar to Tom's comments, I'd, I'd echo the fact that our industry has really here 
proved itself uh, very capable uh, of protecting its workforce, protecting security of supply and looking after our customers uh, during a completely unprecedented year, most notably and recently uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is ongoing. But similar to some of the challenges uh, some of you in the Northern Hemisphere are experiencing at the moment, uh, we too had a bushfire crisis uh, at the start of the year, which really put our systems under strain. Uh, I think the industry has really stepped up. It's demonstrated to government, uh, to regulators and to market operators that it is uh, able to uh, really look after, look after its workforce and its supply uh, very well. But that, does, uh, that doesn't really, unfortunately, help us in the other issue that we're talking about today, and that's uh, the challenges um, for, trans trans for moving towards a lower carbon future. And here in Australia, we continue to grapple with uh, those challenges. Electrification, unfortunately, uh, is not occurring at the kind of rates we're seeing elsewhere in the world. And we still have a lot of political challenges around our emissions reduction targets. Uh, that said, um, the electricity industry itself is, is decarbonising uh, quite productively, uh, but we still have a lot of work to do. Let, let's shift over then uh, into Pat and, uh, and just hear, uh, hear some of your reflections on that. Uh, good evening from Dublin and Europe. Uh, I'm Pat O'Doherty. I'm the CEO of ESP, uh, a vertically integrated uh, electricity company in Ireland, and I'm also the president of Euroelectric which is the European equivalent to both Tom and Sarah's organizations. And Tom and Sarah and I have met on a number of occasions to have these kinds of debates. I suppose for me what 2020 is about, uh, and I echo what Sarah and Tom have said, only we don't have bushfires in Ireland and we don't have hurricanes in Ireland, but we do get storms. Um, you know, I, I think when we look back and we look back from maybe 2030, I think 2020 will be a defining year for our industry. Uh, we've stood up to be counted in terms of COVID-19, of that there is no doubt. And I think for me, what makes me very, very proud to be in this industry is we always talk about the transformational role and the enabling role that is electricity, the society and the communities and the economies that we all have the pleasure to live in are all enabled by electricity and that deep connection and a deep purpose between our industry and the economic and societal growth of our, of, 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 of our countries. And 2020 is no different from that. As I said, we stood up to be counted and we've done amazing things. In ESB, for example, we decided that we were not, the story was not going to be about us and it was not going to be about electricity. Uh, it wasn't about us. This was a medical pandemic, but everything that needed to happen was all enabled by electricity. So by doing what we do quietly uh, was what this year was all about. Um, on, the, on, on the wider front, uh, in terms of decarbonisation, I, I can't help but feel that we're actually living it now. For many, many years, we talked about uh, this change that we're coming, the reimagining of our whole industry uh, right across the whole of the value chain. It's happening. Uh, it's happening before our very eyes. And I think the next decade, or a pace and scale of this are going to leave the last couple of decades of change in the shade. And for me, it's a very, very, very exciting time to be in this industry. It's a very exciting time for us to, as an industry to take a leading in, uh, position in transforming uh, society to a decarbonised economy powered by clean electricity and uh, I, I think when we look back on this year it's going to be quite defining in many respects. I think the theme has been sprinkled through all of us, uh, all of the uh, speakers so far, just around climate change and how it is a defining issue for this industry. Um, uh, certainly we heard resilience in 2020. So uh, <laughs> Katie Sullivan, over to you for opening remarks. Thanks, Scott, and it's uh, really a, a delight to, to be here and discuss these important issues with Tom, Sarah, Pat. Uh, so Katie Sullivan, International Emissions Trading Association, AIDA, um, and we happen to work closely with a lot of these organizations, right, including your electric, certainly EEI. Um, and so we represent the voice of business, collective voice of business around market solutions to tackle climate change. We've been around for over 20 years now, came out of the UN process, uh, and uh, I happen to be based here in Toronto, Canada, uh, and, but cover the world when it comes to our engagement uh, across different sectors and borders. Uh, so, I mean, when I look at 2020, um, 
man, we're, we're going to learn a lot. It's a different year. Uh, it's a challenging year, but I think it's that year um, there is an inflection point. Uh, and I think that what we have seen certainly on um, with COVID uh, and just addressing and the need to address systemic risk, it coincides with the climate crisis and that acknowledgement. So um, I think that this is, you know, the year where you're just going to see, and like I said, this inflection point and this acceleration and major transformation um, across energy systems and financial systems and supply chains and transportation systems and urban planning and everything else. Uh, so it is going to be very, very interesting to see how things play out um, and looking forward to the focused discussion um, around just the decarbonization opportunities and challenges as we head to and through uh, the next round of the UN Climate Talks, November of next year. Thanks, Scott. Well, thank you, Katie. And, and in fact, I'm gonna come right back to you because I'm gonna go in reverse order and it's going to be, uh, it, you are actually probably the critical uh, person who can weigh in on some of, the, of this first question I wanna ask. It's, it's gonna be a little bit multi-part so you can take it however you like. But so Paris Accord, you know, uh, a number of the countries or regions are signed on to that. Uh, we may see, uh, and Tom can comment as we get to that, uh, about uh, what's going to happen in the U.S. Uh, around uh, the uh, the Paris Agreement, and I'll look forward to that. That's why I'll leave him till the end. Um, but inside of that, how have you seen, the, whether it's within regions like the European region, or whether it's been globally between regions, that emissions trading uh, piece uh, actually work? Is it working? Is it not working? Uh, what do you see for the future if you're looking out you know over the next five years around how can regions work together is it happening and uh and will that part b of the question is um in in a world of decarbonization where does that leave some of our fossil fuels from your perspective um what you're thinking of do they exist do they not exist how does that go so kind of part a is how's it working on this emissions trading piece which i think you're right in the middle of but then what would be your perspective on, on fossil fuel in, a, in our sector? So back over to you, I, I think, yeah, I mean, great questions and I'll unpack it uh, with, uh, first of all, for you know, context with the Paris Agreement uh, and as we trickle you know, towards the end of 2020 and head into a really important 2021 year, we have all of these governments um, that are putting forward the enhanced nationally determined contributions, right? These targets post-2020 targets, and not only that, but also these net zero plans, right? Uh, and there's this expectation that we are going to see um, around 150 uh, by early next year of these updated nationally determined contributions guided by governments and these net zero plans. Leave it to Tom and maybe a discussion about, you know, the U.S. and how things potentially will play out there. Um, but, you know, the blueprints are already set in the current national targets, and this is not a Kyoto Protocol world anymore. The Paris Agreement has 195 plus countries that are engaged in this process. And despite even the temporary departure by the US, um, it has remained quite durable, I think over time with all of these countries remaining quite committed to the ambitions, um, goals of that Paris Agreement and having to put forward um, robust and credible climate change strategies in order to do so. Um, on the emissions trading part, I mean, we've seen, including in you know, places like Europe, certainly some of the Canadian provinces in California, these emissions trading systems that existed well before Paris, right? These compliance emissions trading systems that uh, were in existence. But what we have seen since 2015 is just a surge of new players to this, this game and this world of uh, implementing these domestic emissions trading systems. And fortunately, um, there's a lot of lessons learned and exchanges of information and best practices it, as they design, execute, modify these systems going forward. So just based on the latest World Bank study that looks at the state and trends of carbon pricing broadly, um, you're looking at over 60 compliance carbon pricing systems that are around the world right now. Um, and over half of those are emissions trading systems. There are some different flavors to that, but there's some component to trading and carbon markets associated with those. Um, and so for those that already are in existence, there have been a lot of learnings, including from the EU emissions trading system, including from you know, the US, be it the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative or the California and Quebec linked programs. 
um, but they are ultimately reaching the environmental goal. Um, and I think that they are reaching that environmental goal um, at the least cost possible. There are, there have already been a lot of improvements. There will be improvements and reforms that we'll eventually see during um, future iterations of these markets. Um, but ultimately the, the goal of uh, these, these markets, which is uh, achieving the environmental goal in a measurable way, hopefully at least cost, providing flexibility mechanisms, addressing competitiveness, um, those have ultimately achieved the, uh, those objectives. Scott, should I turn it back to you? Oh, and the role of fossil and going forward, yeah. ultimately, yeah. Um, when it comes to all of these systems, right, the first sector to target um, is typically the electricity sector, right, um, and heavy industry. So, I mean, what you see is a lot of uh, these industries and many members um, across the groups who are here today uh, have been either experiencing and already quite sophisticated in these emissions trading systems, um, and uh, or they are, you know, seeing where the puck is headed, and they're already building up the capacity and knowledge uh, around these environmental commodity markets and how to address the challenges, base compliance, and capitalize on the opportunities. Uh, so, you know, the fossil industry it will and continues to be key targeted um, sectors. Uh, and uh, but ultimately, we hope to see these governments choose these policy frameworks um, and, uh, and, you know, policy, um, you know, regulatory opportunities that will uh, decarbonize again at least cost possible. Le great, great, uh, very calm. Uh, and look, the puck, where the puck is going, uh, the Wayne Gretzky analogy absolutely works for me. You know, I love, I love it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Pat, let's, let's get uh, back, back to you. Um, I, same questions. Uh, you know, how do you see this? How are you working together um, in uh, in Europe? And um, and then what do you think about the uh, how does uh, fossil fuel does it exist? Does it not? Over you know over what time frame? So over to you. Yeah. So yes, uh, there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of cooperation going on right across the industry. That doesn't mean that we're all lined up around all of the objectives. You know, different countries in Europe are at are, have different starting positions in terms of their 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 mix, uh, but in Euroelectric we believe uh, strongly in the value of you know a carbon price and the European ETS as a as a real strong driver of de decarbonisation. It is not a panacea, and it has had its difficulties. It has had its difficulties, particularly that the the recession that we all face from about 2010 onwards, it, 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 the, the ETS became very, very difficult to operate. And we spent probably the guts of a decade trying to get it back on track. And uh, we're, we're, we're kind of making progress and along comes COVID. Um, but, you know, it's still a key part of what Europe sees as driving, as, as, as driving forward. And I suppose uh, you know, the ultimate panacea here will be a global price of carbon, but that's not going to happen. But however, some form of, you know, if different parts of the globe, we feel kind of, you know, you kind of acknowledge the role of carbon pricing, that then we, you know, then we might make progress together. Uh, now, of course, there has been quite a bit of carbon leakage from Europe as well. Uh, and, and that is a, from a policy perspective, that is, uh, that's, quite a, that, that, that's quite a concern. I suppose in terms of, in terms of fossil, so today, Europe, uh, you know, two thirds of electricity generated this year in Europe is carbon free. 40% of that, is, you know, for, and for, so 40% is from renewables. Uh, so, so that's quite, 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 quite a bit of progress. Um, the, the European Union is about to sign off on um, a carbon reduction of 55% on 1990 by 2030. The new European Commission as part of the Green Deal is going to do that. And we believe that represents an electrification rate of about somewhere maybe in 30 and 35%. So in our, your, your electric pathways to 2050 uh, sees you know, significant gains possible through decarbonization of our industry and then electrification, particularly direct electrification of heat and transport. Um, and I suppose um, the next phase in renewables in Europe is going to largely uh, be about solar and, uh, and on and offshore wind, 
but coexisting with fossil fuel. Uh, gas in particular, coal is phasing out um, in many, many countries in Europe, not all, and it's going to be in, into the, you know, it, well into the 30s in Germany and beyond that in so other Eastern European countries. But, but gas as a transition fuel, and then I suppose the real challenge then is what is going to provide firm dispatchable power uh, when we get to a world of maybe 60, 70 percent and beyond intermittency with renewables? Uh, here, here in Ireland, we plan to be at 70 percent electricity generation from renewable by 2030. That's our government climate action plan. Uh, we're at 40 percent today. Um, so what is what is the what's the fuel that's going to replace gas? And of course, what fits into that, of course, would be hydrogen, um, CCUS, uh, maybe small modular nuclear, whatever. You know, so there's a whole basket of technologies that are beginning to emerge. And of course, in the middle of that is storage. We've we've been you know for decades we've been talking about storage on a panacea, and we're still not there. Large scale storage by way of pumps, you know, hydro pump storage, but battery storage, and maybe. Hydrogen has options around storage as well. Uh, yeah, well, great, po great points, uh, Pat. And um, and as you said, uh, some aggressive goals, um, and not everyone is on the same page. So I think we're finding that is a common theme uh, amongst uh, across a lot of jurisdictions. So Sarah, uh, over to you. Let's let's hear what's happening uh, in Australia. Uh, here in Australia, uh, unfortunately, we are a long way um, from introducing a carbon scheme. Um, internationally or domestically, and we really do uh, struggle internally with our politics on that issue. Uh, having said that, I think the industry and the community and government are all almost 100% united uh, behind the Paris Accord. So there is strong support uh, for the correctness of climate science and for the need to do something about climate change and for our commitment to Paris. What sits behind that though, starts to fragment a little bit. And uh, whilst industry and the community in a general sense are very supportive of having a carbon policy, and I spend much of my time like a broken record here in Australia, saying to government, uh, what we need is some sort of policy framework that we can work towards to follow this decarbonisation path in the most efficient way possible. So industry and community are very locked on to that, but the federal government politically feels constrained from introducing a carbon scheme, given the politics of the last 10 years in Australia, where issues around carbon policy have been essentially a political football that has determined whether a government will win or lose a federal election. So that's been problematic. And the government therefore has focused on a more politically safe area for it, which is decarbonisation, by technolo technological development, uh, which we welcome, of course, um, it's positive, uh, but without that guiding framework, it becomes much more difficult to meet our obligations as an industry uh, when it comes to our obligations of sustainability and reliability and affordability, uh, which are those three key areas we're always, we're always trying to hit. Um, in relation to net zero by 2050, uh, again, in industry, we are, we are publicly committed to a net zero by 2050 design. Um, it is broadly accepted uh, through community and large business groups, importantly, I think, in the, in the Australian uh, economy. Um, large publicly listed companies like BHP, Qantas, Telstra are all supportive of net zero by 2050. And there's a growing trend towards almost a, an activism around this issue uh, with uh, large corporations that sit outside of the energy industry, which is encouraging. The government says that uh, net zero by 2050 would be great, um, but does not intend to develop uh, a policy that would see us get there. And its actual stated policy is that net zero will be reached sometime in the second half of this century. Uh, we, we do expect and hope that that may turn around um, and they may be able to land politically on net zero by 2050 at, at some point in the future. Around fossil fuels, uh, well, here in Australia, our electricity system is still around 70 odd percent um, of our electricity is generated by, by coal and gas sources. Uh, we, we do, I think, stand with government in the sense that we see fossil fuels as being a part of our energy mix for electricity generation between now and 2050, but an ever decreasing part. 
And that's because we have a lot of aging coal plant that is starting to come to the end of its natural life. We support the sensible exit of that plant. Uh, but gas, uh, particularly peaking gas, is likely to be required uh, as a backup source to sustain reliability in our system uh, as we get to a greater percentage of variable renewable generation. And of course, in Australia, uh, that, means, that means wind and solar. Um, and so it's a bit of a mixed bag here in, here in Australia uh, and still a lot of political discussion around uh, where we're going with net zero. Well, and, and isn't it interesting that, you know, you've got the, the political dynamic, but just it really got, does come down to local resources and, and what you have in each, each region is what I'm, I'm starting to hear as we go through. And, uh, and uh, then Tom, let's, uh, let's transition over to you and, and, uh, and how you would tackle uh, both those uh, questions about, you know, where are we at around um, a, kind of a regional approach uh, around um, uh, shifting away from carbon-based fuels and where do you think those fossil fuels fit uh, over time? Well, I think your your first question, uh, Scott, uh, related to the Paris Agreement too, and uh, with our recent elections, uh, Vice President Biden has said one of the, the uh, first things that he's going to do is to rejoin the Paris Agreement. So that uh, will make 196, Katie, uh, rather than 195, and that's a pretty remarkable number in terms of uh, all the com major all the major company countries in the world. Uh, and as I indicated, I think our, our industry is very, very much committed to decarbonization, to moving toward uh, zero carbon uh, uh, in the 2050 time frame. Uh, and right now we have our 40% of our electricity is zero carbon uh, and renewables are growing very quickly. Uh, nuclear is a major uh, a contributor to a zero carbon based economy in the future. And we're working hard to maintain the nuclear plants we have and to look forward to uh, small modular reactors in the future and the future of electricity. Uh, with, uh, you know, with again, uh, I, I think you've got the compliment there with respect to um, uh, making sure that you have the reliability and, 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 uh, and affordability to have the, the, the best mix. And we think that fossil fuels and natural gas has helped to uh, reduce our carbon emissions at the same time moving off of uh, closing some of the uh, older coal plants in the country. And I think that's gonna continue for a period of time. And uh, um, natural gas is also a, an incredibly important, uh, uh, reliable and low cost uh, energy fuel for us. So uh, we think that's gonna be a, a, an important factor for a while. And, um, you know, but every, every company that's planning their, um, you know, uh, their future is looking at the different sources in their region that can help them to get to that goal. But the important thing is everybody's got the goal. And how fast you, know, you, you move away from fossil fuels is probably gonna be determined by half, how fast you get uh, new technologies on board. And, and that's been spoken to by everybody. Uh, but you've got to make hydrogen, you've got to get hydrogen, green hydrogen to an affordable standpoint. You've got to move forward on CCUS. Uh, we certainly are moving very, very quickly toward additional storage on our system. Uh, and uh, hydro, maintaining your hydro facilities as well. So it's uh, energy efficiency is a big part of the equation. We continue to get more and more energy efficiency, and I think that uh, that will be a major focus of the new administration as well. So it's, a, it's an exciting time for us in the future. And uh, I think that, uh, again, the energy sector will depend a lot upon politics, but it will also uh, depend upon technological evolution. Exactly, Tom. Well said. And um, yeah, we'll uh, look forward to adding another uh, signatory back on the, on the Paris uh, with uh, President-elect Biden. Um, and just I'm going to pick up on that technology theme because I think as, we, as we've heard, you know, it's very much, uh, a re, as you said very well, it's, it's actually what your regional resource mix looks like, but it, and that may define the speed, but everyone's still heading in the same direction. But moving on to the technology. I, maybe I'll just bounce around a little bit. I'm going to start with Pat on this one. Pat, can you can you give us a little bit of insight of your view of, of the future of, of A, the need for transmission 
to try to develop the, uh, the renewable resources that might be across Europe. And then the second one would be um, electrification. How does, is that gonna be, is that gonna grow fast? Is it not gonna grow fast? Uh, what are the elements there for, for you? So, and so the kind of the twofold is transmission and, um, and then electrification. Okay, um, I, and I suppose there are two opposite ends of the spectrum in a way. Uh, so, so transmission, transmission. So, uh, so for me, I, I look at transmission at multiple levels. So there's the, there's transmission across Europe and interconnection, and transmission interconnection. And for Europe, if we're going to share the renewable resources in Europe, which is hydro in the Nordics and the Alps and in the Balkans, so solar in Southern Europe, and maybe offshore wind in Western Europe, uh, then strong transmission interconnection is really, really needed. Um, and, and there's much to be done on interconnection. Um, so we say in a, in a country like, like, like Ireland then, which is small, poorly interconnected in electricity terms, uh, so then transmission then obviously is the backbone, but most 60% of renewables are connected to the distribution system. And that's not unusual, you know, as, as, uh, and particularly as you become more and more distributed, more and more renewables are going to be connected to the uh, to, to the distribution system. So, so significant investment needed in the distribution system all across Europe to facilitate more renewable connections, more distributed energy resources and electrification. So your, your electric has just done a study um, and based on some empirical data we've used just with a number of utilities in Europe to look at what maybe the distribution investment might be needed in the next decade or so in, uh, in Europe and it's coming out of, it could be up to half a trillion euros. Um, so, so there's big, big issues there for regulators and big, big issues then in terms of what does the customer see in terms of bills is going to be very, very important. In terms of electrification, so you, electrification of heat and transport, and maybe transport is the low hanging fruit at the moment, particularly personal transport as in the motor car. Uh, you know, heavy, heavy goods vehicles, maybe less so in terms of electri electrification and, and mass transport in terms of maybe buses, and, and, and rail uh, is, is rail is heavily electrified across Europe, uh, but, but uh, possibilities for for bus transport in, in cities and intercity. Uh, so again, again, significant issues for the distribution system and the design of the distribution system and an investment is needed in the, in the distribution. So the motor car or a heat pump in in, in terms of electrification of uh, of, of heat are, are are kind of the you know, so battery technology in motor cars and, and heat pumps are the are, are technologies of choice here, and integrating in, in terms of the consumer, in terms of demand aggregation, demand management, and getting that to work uh, is going to be a big part of reducing the the level of investment required in the, in, in the distribution system. But you know, back to Tom's point about efficiency, electrification does not make sense. Uh, uh, electrification of heat does not make sense. Uh, and while there are challenges for the distribution systems of making that happen, there's equally huge challenges in terms of the fabric of buildings and the efficiency, the energy efficiency of buildings. So some kind of stimulus, some kind of, of support, uh, governmental support is going to be necessary there to get people to maybe to, to invest significantly in the fabric of their houses in terms of, uh, I, I speak as a Northern European in terms of heating our homes, but if you're in Southern Europe, Europe, you're trying to cool your home in the summer. So it's the, so, but look, so lots and lots of challenges, but lots and lots and lots of huge opportunities. Great. Well, lots going on on both ends of the, uh, of the wire, as they say. And so, uh, uh, that, and I was, I know I've been struck with the, on the electrification side, the motor vehicle, a lot of the European uh, automakers really do have that in their technology plan. And that, that they, they don't really say, some of them have been definitive on saying a timeline, but even if they haven't, um, you know, uh, I was part of a business group that got, was able to visit the BMW headquarters and, and their chief technology officer was just really clear that they're going to all electric. Pol policy there is the driver. There's tightening policy, uh, you know, European emissions targets on, on auto uh, emissions. So that, that's that's actually driving it. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I, like by 2025 is supposed to be, according to commentators, the point at which is the break-even point at which people will, will suffer no financial penalty in opting to go electric in terms of vehicles. Katie, I'm going to come back to you. Um, any, any thoughts on this about 
uh, how we how we make this how we make this move, um, and do we need uh, any kind of a network, whether it be transmission or distribution, as Pat talked about, or this whole piece around electrification? Will that be a driver from your perspective? It's all big. These are all happening simultaneously. It's hard to actually keep up with some of the bigger announcements, right? Um, including a well, hydrogen plan that was just announced today uh, in Ontario, the same day as Canada um, published its Net Zero um, Accountability Act. Um, but also we had, you know, Boris Johnson, the UK 10-point climate plan that came out earlier this week. That's quite ambitious. Um, that is, you know, 16 billion, give or take US dollars. That's supposed to unlock a lot more private capital. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's happening very fast, but continually, I think it's just really going back to, well, Pat's point, but like, show us the money, right? <laughs> show us the avenues to actually provide the incentive for certainly for private, you know, capital to go into um, these massive, you know, projects and opportunities. Um, the stimulus, economic recovery stimulus, you know, packages that are coming out and the greening of them into these kinds of opportunities and like key points of infrastructure, right? And major technologies, that's gonna be really important. And, and you know, we have um, Vivid Economics publishes a regular review of at least it's the G20 plus three, a review of all the, the stimulus packages that have been, you know, deployed to date or announced to date. And so $12.7 trillion that have been announced, uh, they have assessed it being um, around two to three of that trillion have some low carbon, you know, clean link to them. The remainder of that has no real direct link into that. Well, we would hopefully see that improve dramatically. Um, that then goes into supporting electrification and hydrogen and all these other, you know, major major pieces to the puzzle and the journey towards deep decarbonization. Um, and and that's what hopefully there's a lot of trillions to come, right? That we'll see through 2021. So hopefully there's a lot more very clear links into supporting um, the um, the greening of the um, electricity sector. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to come uh, back to you on that, about the role of wires um, in trying to make this happen, and then uh, what do you see for electrification in Australia? It's a hotly debated topic here in Australia, Scott, depending on which part of the supply chain you, you represent. And of course, I represent the generators and retailers here rather than the network businesses. But from our perspective, um, I mean, a deeper transmission grid can make a, a contribution and a real difference to our ability to decarbonise faster. But it's not essential because it is possible to have um, renewable sources of generation closer to where consumers are consuming them and to rely on those assets and you get efficiencies around cost with that sort of setup as well. Um, what we do want to see is we want to resist the urge to overbuild here in Australia. Um, we want rigorous cost benefit analyses happening when we are uh, thinking about extending our network, because every time we do that here, we've got a big, long, skinny grid. Um, it moves the deck chairs for would-be investors in our market. And those investors these days are generally speaking renewable investors. It's all about bringing more renewables into the system. Um, but what we want to do is do it in a cost efficient and planned way. And we don't want to see transmission lines, distribution lines sort of built to nowhere, if you like, um, that will only result in consumers paying more. We feel like that balance is, is really important. So that's a really hotly, hotly contested um, area here. We all want to get to the same goal point, um, but maintaining the efficiency of our grid here in Australia is a real challenge. And that challenge is exacerbated by the fact that we are absent a guiding policy framework uh, to get us there. Uh, and we have competing federal and state government regulations and intentions around network build and frankly generation build as well. So it's all very hotly contested. Um, there are often competing market interventions by state and federal governments in different jurisdictions here and that's making things more complex and potentially ultimately more expensive for consumers. So we try and get back to basics in the generation um, sector and keep referring to what our energy regulator uh, has in terms of investment tests, uh, which is essentially a sort of a cost benefit analysis for where we should be building um, new networks. Now, around electrification, um, electricity is around a third of our emissions here in Australia. Um, 
other sectors of the economy, and I'm thinking of transport, I'm thinking of uh, heavy industry and agriculture, have really not progressed very far at all in terms of electrification. And that is a really big challenge for us. Uh, I often think of it as a bit like the, uh, the elephant in the room whenever we're talking about moving towards decarbonisation. Here in electricity, we're doing more than our fair share of the heavy lifting, but absent guiding policy, I think it's going to be really challenging for transport and electric vehicles um, to get a leg up here in Australia. Uh, we may have to end up relying on some sort of regulatory framework there to help them along, but hopefully that will change, uh, that will change in the medium term. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, let, let's just close it off uh, with uh, out of the US, Tom, what's your thoughts on, uh, you know, to enable a lot of this, uh, do we need wires, do we not? What, uh, and uh, an electrification, where do you see that going in the United States? Yeah, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna do it in obverse order because I think that you use the analogy of uh, Gretzky, uh, who I believe was a Canadian, I know was a Canadian, uh, going to where the puck was gonna be. Yeah. Uh, you know, we wanna start out with that because that's where we're heading as to more electrification, particularly as, uh, as was indicated here in the transportation sector. We see every major automobile company uh, now moving toward electric vehicles. I own one of the very, very first electric vehicles, uh, the EV1 from GM. Uh, I can't say that it was the best car that I ever owned, uh, but it was moving the technology. And uh, now we are in a point right now where people don't buy electric vehicles uh, because they're uh, saving the environment, they're, they're, they're buying them because they're just great cars. And every part of the automobile is getting more electrified. Uh, but beyond automobiles, uh, uh, and we now have a million and a half electric vehicles on the road in the United States, uh, uh, and its market share is growing uh, strongly, is that, um, you know, we also are getting uh, clean school buses. Uh, we've got fleets like Amazon and, uh, and FedEx and other companies, uh, Walmart, et cetera, that are uh, electrifying their fleets. And I, I just think that this is... Uh, uh, is moving on all fronts. Um, on other parts of electrification uh, in the uh, commercial and industrial sector, I think that's happening too, maybe at a slower pace, but, uh, but I think you're gonna see that picking up as well. So again, electricity is gonna become more and more important uh, for green reasons and for efficiency reasons and a whole lot of other reasons. So that leads you to, to the point where if, you're, if electricity is growing and renewables are growing, uh, that you need more uh, transmission. And you really, in our country, I think, can get bipartisan support for the need for additional transmission, uh, which is the good news. Uh, the bad news is it's still very, very difficult to site. So to find the site to get, uh, you know, local, to get through objections from the local people that, uh, that may not want it. Uh, but I think it's going to continue to happen. We're going to expand the transmission to the extent that it's needed. Uh, and... Uh, Again, the overall picture all is all interrelated to each other. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like how you teed that up and you went really from the load consumption and around electrification and then and then how are we going to get there and how are we going to get that through, whether it's transmission. Let, let me just, uh, uh, you know, try to finish here a little bit with, with a question about we've got all this happening, uh, you know, whether we need new wires or not, whether it's T or D, um, whether uh, it's what type of new renewable uh, in our decarbonation path um, or not, we know that change is upon us. And we know that these are very dynamic and exciting times in our industry. But at the end of the day, what do you think about our customers? What, how are our customers going to handle this change? And are they going to be able to afford it? Or is it going to be cheaper? Um, I know I've heard both sides of it. It's going to be it's going to be better. It's going to be cleaner. It's going to be cheaper. Uh, other people say no. Uh, it'll price ourselves right out of the market. Where, where do you guys sit on that? And I'm and I, maybe I'll start with uh, with uh, let's go with Sarah on this one to lead us off about where are you know in five to ten years where are customers going to be at? better off, worse off. Well, we want them to be better off, uh, definitely. I think we're still on that journey though. And in the industry, we're often grappling with trying not to treat customers as being all the same because different sections of our customer market 
have different views and are at different places when it comes to accepting and understanding what decarbonisation is going to mean. Um, what we'd like to have is customers who are engaged or at least understand a little bit the market and, and demand side response and their involvement uh, and their control over their energy usage and where it comes from at home, we think will be really important. Um, but that's really a pressure on the industry and on governments to help educate people and bring them along on that journey. And we've still got a long way to go here in Australia. I think uh, the community in a general sense is extremely supportive of decarbonisation and our emissions goal for that sustainability piece. But they remain worried and can be easily triggered by government talk about uh, reliability issues, for example, no one wants to see blackouts and affordability issues too. Um, there is a study done which shows that there is a certain price point at which people will become more interested in affordability um, than in how sustainable their energy sources are. So we're hoping that with education um, over the next five to 10 years and technological advancement and increasing decarbonisation, uh, we can help uh, engage our customers more and have them enjoy a more connected understanding with their energy supply and, and hopefully cheaper bills as well. Great, great, uh, great comments. Um, let, me, let me bounce over to Katie and just get her perspective on this. Our customers, your average everyday person, uh, how does this look for them five to 10 years out? I think, again, um, I, I go back to that role of flexibility and these, you know, flexible, you know, compliance pathways and options for, for industry and keeping costs low. And um, I know that we're running out of time. So I think, you know, I'll circle back to just when you look at the Paris Agreement, the operationalization of the Paris Agreement, that we are heading into a really critical year um, and a critical conference of the parties in uh, November of next year, there's one article in that Paris Agreement that has yet to be um, finalized around the actual Paris rule book. The um, operations, the modalities, the procedures, that's Article 6, that's that role of markets, it's that role of international trading, right? Allowing countries to actually cooperate in order to reach their climate goals um, or enhance the level of ambition for those climate goals. Uh, and so to put some numbers to this, I understand that just running around the world, including with many of our you know, members and businesses, where it's saying, no, trust us, these markets and these tra this trading, it actually matters. We decided to quantify that in working with the University of Maryland and actually put some numbers to the cost savings that if you were to allow for these perfect trading you know, systems in the world, and so all countries were to achieve their nationally determined contribution, as currently submitted to the UN, right? And they did it alone without that international cooperation, those flexible, you know, um, trading opportunities, right? Versus if you were allow, if you were to allow for those countries to trade based on the different marginal abatement costs around the world, right? Um, we uh, we discovered based on the modeling that ballpark, you're looking at a cost savings of around 380 billion tons or billion dollars a year US by 2030, right? Nothing to sneeze at. And then if you were to actually say, okay, that's the cost savings in aggregate, right? 2030 a year by allowing for these flexible mechanisms in trading. If you were to take that and say, well, all countries were going to put this into reaching their climate goals anyway, as a willingness to pay. So if you're actually to translate that into then enhanced greenhouse gas mitigation, right? Investments into removals, you could unlock an additional nine to 10 gigatons, billion tons a year um, of these additional reductions, right? By, by 2030. So, you know, that's kind of the narrative spot um, around just the affordability and then tailor that story to, you know, your customer base, right? Or your region. Um, but that's ultimately, it, it does matter through both the cost savings lens and an enhanced ambition climate mitigation lens. So I guess, you know, we've heard this theme of uh, this, this path is quite regional, you know, depending on each of our speakers about how quickly people are moving. But what you're proposing is if we work together in a bigger way around trade policy, we can actually make this a lot more cost effective. So, uh, yeah, great, great, great points. Um, Pat, I think I'll go to you um, just uh, for your thoughts on this. Uh, uh, can we, can our customers afford this or are they going to be see all the extra money in their jeans. How's it, how's it all going to work? I think it'll be, we'll have done a really bad job if, if we all wake up and our customers are believe that 
we, we put a huge cost burden on them. So affordability has to be at the heart of this. And it's back to that enabling role that I said that electricity plays. Uh, like the competitiveness of industry, if we're going to electrify, is based, you know, is very much dependent on 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 on, on, on the price of electricity to industry and to business. I suppose from a residential customer point of view, uh, it, it is really, really important that we we, we, we point out and we, we you know, there's I, th I think maybe Sarah talked about uh, uh, about engagement and, and about education. You know, you know what, are, what are we at here? I think for 100 years we've sold kilowatt hours. We've got to move away from that. We're not selling kilowatt hours anymore. We're selling comfort. We're selling a way of life. Uh, that's what it's really about. Um, so, it's, you know, kilowatt hours are just things that are taken for granted. Um, so we have to be able to connect with our customers so that, you know, they, when they come to make choices that are expensive, so whether to change their heating in their home, change the boiler in their home, whether they come to change their car, they go, they, 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 they go electric. Uh, so, 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 so there's a huge, so getting it right, right across the whole of the value chain. In Europe, we have a very disaggregated model. We've, we, we've wholesale markets, we've retail markets, and we've got networks regulated in between. Uh, so, so it all has to come together and all has to fit together seamlessly. The role of the network is really, really, really important. Uh, the role of the network in facilitating all of this and f facilitating uh, different value propositions being offered to customers by suppliers through smart technology like smart metering. The, the, the smartening of the distribution grid is, re is, is really, really important. So all of these things have to come together. To come together, it needs a perfect alignment of government, policymakers, and the industry. And uh, you know, I, I, back to my opening, I talked about the leadership role that we've played for decades in, 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 in creating brighter futures and brighter possibilities for all of our customers. And that's what we have to, that's the mindset we as an industry need and to embrace that in a very, very positive way. And back to the values that underpin what we do, the values of that deep connection we have with customers and the communities we serve. So it's more than just that commercial focus we have. Yes, we're commercial, we have to make money, but all, we have to make money to invest in the future, but also to do that in a way that, that, that brings customers along this journey with us together uh, is, 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 a, is the biggest challenge in all of this. So that alignment of government policy, industry, and our customers uh, all in in unison. That's uh, uh, that's exactly it. And let's let's hope we can make it make it happen. So uh, great great words, uh, Pat and Mr. Kuhn, uh in a, in the uh, U.S. I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, what's your perspective on where this all gets to in our customers' eyes? Well, Scott, it's a great great last question because everything you know in in business school you learn. That, in, in a business, everything needs to start and to end with the customer uh, and everything in between, because that's really why we're in business, uh, to serve the customer and meet their needs. And electricity has been so incredibly uh, uh, versatile and efficient to uh, serve new needs throughout the last 100 and so plus years of its existence. And we, we basically, um, see a situation here where we know the customer wants it cleaner. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's really the, not just politicians that are driving us that way, it's customers that are driving us that way, but they also want it reliable and affordable. Uh, and we've got to keep all of those goals in mind as we move forward. And it is so very, very important um, to uh, make sure that we can keep reliability there, but also on the affordability side, we have been able to achieve the first 45% reduction in emissions from 2005 levels while keeping uh, you know, rates at or below the level of inflation. And, and that is a remarkable achievement. And I think that uh, you know, our goal is to continue to do that in the future. So when we look at the new technologies that we need to uh, bring on, we have to continue to keep that in mind, that they have to, they have to meet all those goals. Um, and I think that we have a situation here where we talk about electrification. Customers are going to be seeing the different role, uh, uh, um, you know, roles of electricity. They're going to be seeing the situation that they're going to be plugging in their car rather than stopping at a gas station. And that's going to offer them savings on their overall energy bill. And those things are all positive. And I think the same thing with commercial and industrial businesses. So the future is bright, but we do have a continuing challenge. I, I think the past 
tells us that we can that we can do it and we can be successful. And we've got to continue to build an electric system that's smarter, stronger, and cleaner. It, and we've got to continue to make sure we uh, meet that challenge in the future. Very well said, uh, Tom. Um, well, I want to thank uh, everyone. I mean, we've heard, it's amazing how while well we've heard there are regional differences. Uh, I think as Tom said it, everyone is is marching. It might be on a little different time frame or a little bit different path, but we're all focused. And uh, this concept of our, our customers are taking us there. Um, and we need to find the ways that they can uh, do it. Uh, we can do it reliably and economically as, uh, uh, as our customers are driving it is a great uh, theme to add. And, and clearly um, it's an exciting time in our industry. Um, change, I think, is uh, incredibly exciting, and it's a way that uh, we can really put all of those great things we've learned uh, uh, through our careers and, in fact, build careers uh, through this, what is going to be pretty radical change uh, across the space. So, uh, you know, Tom and uh, Pat, Sarah, Katie, I just want to thank you very, very much. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation, and I know the audience uh, does as well. So, with that, uh, we'll uh, say thank you uh, from across the global network here and um, I really appreciate the time.